to say welcome also uh, to our online guest. All right, praise God to Understanding Bible and Bachelor's Assembly, located right here in Clayton, Delaware, 355 West Duck Creek Road. The service has already begun in person, so now we've uh, chosen to open up for the online portion as well. Praise the Lord Jesus. <laughs> so, you guys, you guys love the technology, man. Too talk. All right, so uh, so we chose to, uh, to open up for, uh, for online as well. So we want to say welcome you. Get ready to clear your hearts and minds. We're going to bring back the worship team to continue to cultivate this atmosphere and get ready for, for God's word. Amen? Amen. So we want to say welcome to you as well. Amen. Amen. Welcome back our worship team. Thank you, Lord. Right here in your presence. 
sound right here in your presence. Oh, Hallelujah. Right here yeah. in His presence, Hallelujah, yeah. Lord God. And we understand we are Jesus, our Lord and Savior. His presence is already in this Lord God. And we continue to cultivate, Lord God, and be in His presence everywhere of our lives. What does that mean? That means everything that we say and do, we need to be led by Him, and so yeah. the presence yeah. is already intertwined with us. So when we do that, we never leave His presence. Praise God. We can see Him just walking out, Lord God, Hallelujah. Praise God, praise God. Oh, it's a great thing. That's a great thing. All right, all right, all right. Now, let's get ready for our pre methods first. Why do we do this? It's very, very important that when we come together, we understand that it's not just, it, there's the assembling part, praise the Lord, but we come to make sure that our hearts and minds are clear and we can receive all that God has for us from the, from the greeter to the door to the ushers to the sound of music, but also. In regards to his word, amen. amen. That's what we need. So let's make sure our hearts and minds are clear. What does that mean? I mean, we, we, we forget about whatever happened last week. We, <laughs> we forget about all those things because God has for us to do this. But that being the case, let's look at what our pre message charge tells us to do. Let's reference James 1 22 to 25, New King James Version. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. He is like a man who goes to service, okay? For he uh, observed himself, goes away, so he goes to service, leaves service, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. Immediately forgets what he or she learned, okay? Amen. We don't want to be that man. And that's just for Lady Sip. So when they say man, talk about mankind. So that's for you too, ladies, all right? But he, this is us right here, but he who looks into the perfect law of liberty, this is the word, and continues in it, and it is not a forgetful here, but a doer of the word. This one, everybody say this one. This, this one. one will be blessed in what he does. So we want to fall into that category, right? So that being the case, our pre message charge is to make sure that anytime you come to service, I'll give this to a podcast, sitting down with the word, coming to service, both in person or digitally, make sure you clear your hearts and minds, and then say, hey, what? I want to be that doer of the word. So let me. Let me commit to myself that I want to take away at least one thing I want to apply this week. It's got to be something different than just one that, than, no shade on the teachers, so that was one too, no shade. But it's got to be different than that. It's got to be, I, I'm leaving here that I want to commit, that I want to apply something this week. Because I want to be like that second guy, the doer of the work. Amen? Amen. Okay? All right, that being the case, let's get ready for God's message for today. So God's message with regards to understanding the kingdom of God. Understanding the kingdom of God. You've heard uh, this, that, let's just say that terminology, for lack of a better word, said and spoken a number of different times, but it's, God wants to make sure everyone is clear on what he means by that. So, this is for today is understanding the kingdom of God. Let's look at our foundation of scripture, Luke 17, 20 through 21. Luke 17, 20 through 21. All right? And we'll look at the Amplified Classic Version. Now this is this is background is Jesus was around and this is he's talking and then he's asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God will come. He talking about Jesus. He replied to them by saying, The kingdom of God does not come with signs to be observed or with visible display. You know, I keep that. He said the kingdom of God does not come with signs to be observed or with visible display. Nor will people say, look, here it is, or see, it is there. So he's saying the kingdom of God doesn't want to physically see and disappoint you like that. For behold, the kingdom of God is where? It's within you, uh, in your hearts, and among you, surrounding you. Okay? Keep that, keep that foundation in mind, which Jesus gave us an instruction about where the kingdom of God is located. Okay? Let's, let's go forward with it. Now, so God's objective for this particular message really is simply uh, just for, to get us to a place where we understand the kingdom of God. To get us to a place where we understand the kingdom of God. When we, when we get this, folks, when we get this mindset, then we should go out and really operate differently. We should see the world, see people at our jobs, see people at the Wawa, see the issue with your car. We should see all these things with now a kingdom mindset. We have to look at things differently. Because other than salvation, Jesus is telling people to repent. 
a lot of his teaching was teaching of people who have a different mindset about the kingdom of God. Does that make sense? Because he wanted them to change the way they were thinking, so he taught them concepts about the kingdom of God. Amen? All right, now, let's go forward with it. Now, part of the objective in regards to that is we're, God is going to be answering some of those internal questions you may have had that are common regarding questions about the kingdom of God. A lot of people may have heard the terminology, and so God is going to answer some of those internal questions, but you may or may not have asked those questions before. And it's good when we have questions. That means we're trying to learn. That's a good thing. But we're going to answer some of those, God's going to answer some of those internal common questions about the kingdom of God. All right, now, so let's go right into the questions. Amen? So, what is the kingdom of God? Well, in essence, it, the kingdom of God is God's system, method, and way of doing things. God, the Bible also calls it his government. It's his structure. It's his way of doing things, guys. It's God's system, method, and way of doing things. In the Greek, we use the word basilia, which means uh, sovereignty, power, dominion, the realm in which a sovereign king rules. So we have to understand that. You can reference these scriptures. You can reference Matthew 6, 33, Isaiah 9, 6, uh, Luke 1, 32 through 33, 1 Corinthians 15, 28, Mark 4, 26 through 32, just to name a few. So, it got, it, so look at this as God's system, method, and way of doing things. That's the broad, overall kingdom of God in a nutshell. All right? Now, that being the case, so where is it located? We already saw part of it um, where Jesus talked in the, in the foundation scripture, but it's located in different places. One, uh, it's located both in heaven, in heaven and in earth. You can reference Psalm 103 and 19 and Matthew 6 and 10. And, like our foundation scripture, it's also... Once one receives Jesus as their Lord and Savior, they, we, are now kingdom citizens. We have to understand this. When we get this mindset, we, things should change. We are, now kingdom of, we are now kingdom citizens, and that means the kingdom of God is within us. All right? So, that being the case, it's in our hearts and surrounding us. And we are getting reference on the foundation of Scripture. You also reference John 3 and 3. So, again, so the kingdom of God is located... In heaven, in earth, and within us. Once you choose to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the kingdom of God is within you. We're going to talk a little bit more about it. All right? Now, that being the case, so let's also reference Colossians 1, 12-13. Colossians 1, 12-13, Amplified Version. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints. Let me pause right there. Now, I... Uh, I know we, we praise God. God has a, lot, a number of people observing the service from other countries and maybe even other religions, so we just want to be clear on this. Some of the background that you may have heard from other religions makes it seem that saints are only certain people. Uh, saint, saint this or, or Saint so-and-so. From a biblical accuracy perspective, once you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you are a saint of God. All right? You've got to get that down. You are a saint of God. You are God's people. So it's not... Like in some religions, only certain people are called saints, as if it's like a certain special thing. Well, it is special the way God looks at it, because once you chose to receive his son, that is the crowning thing right there. Once you chose to do that, you are a saint of God, okay? So he's talking to all of us that choose to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. So giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us, <coughs> who is to us, who is to choose to Jesus as Lord and Savior, qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints, God's people, in life. For he, and what God, has rescued us and has drawn us to himself from the dominion of darkness. What does that mean? That, yeah, that means before you made Jesus your Lord and Savior, you, I, we, were all in darkness. What does that mean? It, even though you were walking around, getting up, doing what you wanted to do, we, we, there were blindfolds over our eyes because the lifestyle in which we lived didn't glorify God because we didn't have a Lord. We had a Lord. Our Lord was the devil. But it, it wasn't the proper Lord. Right. And so the Bible says you are the, you are the devil of your father. You are the father of the devil. So if you don't have Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I love you, beloved. But please know it's our desire that you receive Jesus as your Lord. So, But until then... You, we were all in darkness. That's why it's so important for us that now have Jesus as the light through us, that we shine that light. Because when we were in darkness, we couldn't see. But now when we just do the things God has for us to do, impacting one person at a time, 
sharing, talking, ministering, whatever we do that God has for us to do, that is like a glimmer or brightness of light that now helps that person that's in darkness to begin to see. You know, when you're in the dark, it's helpful to have some light. Like, I'm not being you. You walk around, you, and you're walking, you're alive, and you're feeling, but you don't know where you're going. Yeah. But when, oh my God, but let this either a glimmer of light or a, a huge light. Well, and there, there is no this little light. This Jesus is a big light. But I mean, in terms of what you share. Glory to God, any light is going to help that person begin to see. And that's why we got to do our part. All right? So, uh, for he has rescued us from the, <clears throat> and has drawn us to himself from the dominion of darkness, and it has transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. So we got to understand, we didn't do anything to deserve this transference that God blessed us with, other than choosing to believe that Jesus is Lord. Amen? So when we choose to do that, there are a whole bunch of things uh, that we get just because we made that decision, none of which we did by works. And that's a good thing. Praise the Lord. Amen. All right, now. So, let's go to the next question. Are there instructions or guidance about being a kingdom of God system? So, are there instructions? So, tell all right, so you, you understand now that I chose to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I understand now there's a kingdom of God, and I understand I'm a kingdom citizen. But are there any instructions that are there any guidance about how to do this thing? How, okay, yeah, the answer is yes. Part of it is overall is the, your ongoing continual relationship with Jesus combined with doing the word. So when we continue to have a relationship with Jesus, talking to him, sharing him, reading his word, and that we choose to do what Jesus tells us, what the Holy Spirit tells us, and what God tells us to do in the word of God, then we're getting some of these instructions and guidance, all right? So you can... References a couple of pieces here, Matthew 6 and 33. Again, you go back and reference these yourself, but he says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to me. So, how do you apply that? What that says is, in that moment at work, when you got that challenge from the co worker, your flesh is going to want to do something. It's going to want to say something. It's going to want to put those capital letters in that email. It's going to want to do all those things. But what this principle is saying, no, no, no. Seek ye first the kingdom. So what does that mean? That means what is God's system, method, and way of doing something in this moment? So you have to do that first. And then all these other things, the, the, you already have the peace, but all these other guidance pieces will come with that. So it's not, let me just go and do what I want to do. When we talk about the next series, we talk about how to talk to people about Jesus, sometimes we have to change our mindset. Yeah, we just go out to get some milk. We got to start to change our mindset to say, wait, let me see first the kingdom of God. So, yes, I do have a natural need. I need milk for my cereal, huh? I don't want a food line. But guess what? Now I need to start thinking, all right, I got to think, who will God speak through me to talk to somebody and let milk be the secondary? Right. Even though the natural, the milk is the primary, we got to change our mindset to say, now if I'm seeking the kingdom first, I gotta go out and be like, I gotta be open. But we'll talk about that in healthy. But that's that's an example, all right? So again, Matthew chapters five through seven is, is listed as the Beatitudes. Jesus was trying to get them to understand, look, there are different ways of thinking than it was in the old testament, the old law. He was trying to get them to go and say, No, 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 no. We we no longer just go around hating on those who don't like us. We gotta love them. Right. That's a different mindset. That's a kingdom mindset. That's some of the set of instructions. First Corinthians 11 and 1 it says, Paul's talking about imitate me as I imitate Christ. What does that mean? So Paul's saying, when you see people that are Christians, when they are doing God's system, method, and way of doing things in the area of your life, you can choose to say, I'm not as mature in that area yet. Let me follow how that person is doing that, because now that gives me an opportunity to grow. Along with hearing from the Holy Spirit, reading the scriptures, that's God just gives us another natural example through a person. Say, I can follow that person. Now let me pause on this and say this. Let me add a little extra piece here. Uh-oh. I love y'all. <laughs> you know what I say, I love these little things. <laughs> so, I understand there are a number of people who over time, unfortunately currently, will look at people 
that go to local assemblies, that walk around and say people in church are hypocrites. When they'll say Christians are hypocrites. One of the things that God put on my heart to say to people in response to that is, I agree with you that people in church sin and make mistakes. From the pulpit to the side wall to the back door to the usher to the greeters. But what I also say to them, but what has God done to you? Right, right, right. It's about your relationship with God. Don't throw God out with the bath water. Mm -hmm. So, and when you do, you will learn, guess what? That pastor, that person on the third row, the, the usher rooms, we are all being sanctified and continuing to grow. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's very true. That you, it's a fact that you may have caught them in a bad moment. He didn't smile at you the right way. Or she came off at you about the offering. Or, or whatever. So, but you got to understand, God didn't do anything to you. So don't leave God because of some person. Because guess what? That's not going to fly. When it comes to that judgment, God's not... That way, hey, what the pastor's wife said may have been all. But guess what? That's going to be for her godly account if she didn't repent to deal with. That's not going to help you. So make sure that you say, hey, God, you ain't doing nothing to me. I'm going to continue to go. And as you do that, you will learn grace and forgiveness for that pastor, for that usher, for that person. Because guess what? All of us have a challenging moment, and there may be areas that we're growing in. Guess what? Uh-oh, uh-oh, coming out of the street. You didn't leave your job. Oh. You didn't leave your job when your supervisor did. Oh. You didn't leave your family when Cousin Popo said it at the barbecue. Come on now. All right, let's just start. So, when we find people that, that are growing in an area that we can imitate, that's fine. God's saying, hey, that's another way of instruction. Yes. All right? <clears throat> Romans 1 and 17, just shall live by faith. Again, we talk about Faith is being sure of what you hope for and certain of what you do not see. So as believers, we are called to live as a lifestyle by faith. So that's, that's a lifestyle for us. So we are called to both live and receive by faith. Does that make sense? So we're called to pray and receive by faith. So that's a lifestyle for us. That's just one set of instructions. And then here you hear, you see Romans 8, 5 through 17, living by the Spirit. You gotta be, once you choose to receive the baptism with the Holy Spirit, you gotta let the Holy Spirit continue to guide you. So these are just some set of instructions and guidance about being a kingdom of God citizen. Just a few. But again, the, on, the main piece is the ongoing relationship with Jesus and getting to your word and doing the word. Amen. 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 That being the case. So let's look, look at another scripture we reference. Joshua 1 and 8, New King James Version. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. What does that say? That means when you're reading the scriptures, we need to be speaking the scriptures. Don't speak the circumstance, speak what the scriptures say. Amen. We went over this, we went over this with verbally charting your destiny mm -hmm. series. Don't speak the challenge. You don't see God walking around complaining. God is speaking his destiny. He's calling it forth. So you do the same thing. So this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. You should be speaking scriptures, both in front of yourself, but also being a blessing to other people. Other people going through, you have an answer yeah. for them. It's revealed in the scripture. All the different things God is telling you to do. So don't let this book of the law depart from your mouth. These are instructions. But you shall meditate in it day and night. So now when we say the scriptures, we're getting involved with the scriptures. We're reading them. That you may observe us to do according to all that is written in it. So right there we learn we need to be saying the scriptures. We need to be reading and reviewing the scriptures. And we need to be doing the scriptures. Again, these are instructions about how to be a kingdom of God citizen. Um, so all that is written in it. For then... See, all these things are followed. So the whole then is conditioned on the, the first sense. For then you will make your way prosperous. And then you will have good success. Okay. So this whole last sentence is conditioned on us doing the first sentence. Amen. And this fall on cycle of osmosis. And we talked about that principle series. There's some blessings from God that are automatic, but there are a number of blessings that are God that are conditional on us doing our 
for it. That's right. Yeah, that being the case. So, another question. So, is there a difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven? Because we see both in the scriptures, we hear people talk about it. So, let's get into it. Is there a difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven? Well, the overall answer is yes and no. You understand the kingdom of God is God's. This is government. It's, it's got a system, method, way of doing things. So the kingdom of heaven, and you can reference these scriptures. You can reference uh, Daniel 7, 13 through 14, Jude 14, and we don't say like, Jude 1 because Jude is only one chapter of the All right, so uh, 2 Timothy 4 and 1, Matthew 4 and 17, Matthew 13 and 44, uh, Matthew 24, 29 through 31, 25 and 1, 25 and 14. This is a few examples. So, but the kingdom of heaven, in essence, is this. So the kingdom of heaven is, will occur again at Jesus' second coming. I'm going to explain that in a second. When Jesus is physically back down here on earth. That is the kingdom of heaven. Now, let me take a moment to explain his second coming. Because I know there's been a number of questions about that. So when Jesus was, was down here, before he died, when he came to, you know, when he was birthed by the dead virgin Mary. You know, Mary ain't a virgin no more, so we just probably stop calling her virgin Mary. <laughs> so, 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 yeah, so when, Kate, when she was then a virgin, Jesus came to, you know, so the Jesus that we know, he died and rose again, that Jesus, so he was physically down here on earth. He's going to come back again, but let me just explain in a chronological way so we understand this. So right now we are living down here on earth. Those of us choose to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, we're Christians. There's going to be a time, and we're talking about from a chronological perspective, okay? We're going to do, we'll get more into it when we do the series, but right now we're going to do a general piece. There's going to be a time when Jesus comes, we call it the rapture. The Bible says it's being caught up. When Jesus comes, he cracks the sky. We've talked about this before. When that happens, the very first thing that's going to occur is the dead in Christ will rise first. So, let's put it all together. So, when the Bible says, being absent from the body to be present with the Lord. So, when those who are Christians transition, their spirit and soul is with Jesus currently. I have a pop-up. This is my pop-up as an example, right? He was a believer. His spirit and soul are currently with Jesus. When Jesus comes back for the rapture, pop-up spirit and soul, who is currently with Jesus, will be with his physical body, because his physical body is still buried in stuff. Whatever agrees that is in terms of the Africa, right? Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> right. Will be supernaturally merged, and he will then get a glorified body, the same body that Jesus had when Jesus rose from the dead. Got it? That's the first thing that's going to happen when Jesus comes, when he cracks the sky. Obviously, the dead in Christ will rise first. So he's going to have the same glorified body. His spirit, soul, and body will be merged, boom, and put together. Then those who are alive at that time, let's just say Jesus comes right now, all of us that are alive, that supernatural murder, our spirit, soul, and body is going to then also get a glorified new body. All right? So we're all, both those that are dead in Christ and those currently living, will all get new glorified bodies and will be with Jesus. At that point in time, when Jesus cracks the sky and we get caught up, or I.e. the rapture, Jesus is in the sky, the Bible calls it, in the clouds. That's not the second coming. Okay. It may seem like that because the second time he's you see him being the earth, but the first time he was physically walking around, like he was sleeping on the boat. This time he's coming and staying in the sky. We are caught up with him. Got it? Mm -hmm. After that time, it's going to be a bad time for people on earth. Mm -hmm. Because people who are going to realize they should have had Jesus as their Lord and Savior, but it's a real bad time. The Bible calls it tribulation, the great tribulation. It's going to be years of people experiencing a whole bunch of bad stuff. Then when people choose to get with the Lord, there's going to be, the Antichrist is going to rise up. He's going to make things real bad down here, in particular killing people who want to be Christians. Yeah. Um, that's why it's better to do it now. Do it now. Do it now. <laughs> All right? So that, that being the case, Going up the chronology, then when that Antichrist gets to a point where he wants to take over the temple in Jerusalem, which is real sacred to them, he's going to try to take over a particular aspect of that throne, Jesus will then come back 
physically with all the people, all the saints with him, physically down here on earth. That will be the second time Jesus is on here on earth. That's why it's commonly called his second coming. That's different from the rapture. When he comes then, a couple of things are going to happen. One, he's going to destroy the Antichrist. Number two, he's going to put the devil away in one section of hell. We'll talk about that series later on. One section of hell for a thousand years. That's why this time period is also called the millennium reign. But also this time, and then all, everyone else, Jesus is going to have the angels that were um, to make sure that they take care of, and get rid of, of all drama and lawlessness and people and put them in a section of hell. That's why this period is then also called... Here's the summation, the kingdom of heaven. Because it's going to be like heaven down here on earth during that thousand years. We will be reigning with Jesus. That's why, so when Jesus is physically down here on earth and takes care of those things. And oh, and also, the Jewish people, the same one that Gentiles did it too, but the Jewish people who gave up Jesus, who turned their backs to him. A lot of you may know that a lot of the people who are Jewish don't even read the New Testament because they don't believe that they, as a people, could have done something like that. And for a number of reasons, but the main thing is they don't believe that they could have done like something like that to a Jesus. They are going to be reconciled to God because they're going to realize they messed up. So that's also what's going to happen during that time period. They're going to repent and, rec and reconcile to God as a nation, but they're going to go through a whole bunch of drama. So, but that time period is going to be called the kingdom of heaven because it's going to be like heaven down here on earth because everything from that point during that time will be pure bliss. That is the kingdom of heaven. Okay? So, the kingdom of God is the broad peace. The kingdom of heaven is that time period when Jesus is back down here on earth, taking care of those things, and it's going to be bliss on earth. So when they're down here on earth, it's the kingdom of heaven atmosphere, but they will be doing the kingdom of God stuff. Does that make sense? So, does that make sense? Yes. Okay, cool, cool. Alright, so, getting... Let's go into a little bit more differences here. So again, still stick with that same question. So let's follow it up. So Matthew 13, 24 through 30, and 36 through 43, New King James Version. And another parable, the way we understand what a parable is, Jesus would use a, a natural example for a spiritual benefit because when he would he would talk to his disciples sometimes it was different because he thought they could just understand spirit spirit. But other people who were, who he wanted to get things get them to understand things, sometimes they, didn't, they weren't getting it, so he had to speak to them in a parable. He had to tell, give them natural examples that had a spiritual lesson. In particular, he would use terminology that was familiar with them during their culture in that time. So another parable, he told Jesus, another parable he put forth to them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in the field. So, it's like Jesus, who showed good seed in the field. He told people, to come, come receive Jesus, your Lord and Savior. This is the way to go, okay? But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. That's the enemy come. Come and tell people, no, no, hey, live the life the way you want to live it. Go do what you want to do. It's fun, passing pleasure to sin, that kind of stuff. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So that means as people were in earth time as it continued to develop, you had people who received Jesus and other people who didn't, whoever received Jesus. Alright? So the servants, who you'll see is, will be the angels, so the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in the field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, an enemy has done this. The servant said to him, do you want us then to go and gather them up? He's like, hey, do you want us to get rid of all of them? Like, we can start all over. Just, just, just there. You want us to start, you know, get rid of all of them. But he said, no, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. The wheat was those who received Jesus, the Lord and Savior. Okay? He said, no, don't do that, because then you'll, you'll gather up all, all of our believers. Let both grow together, like it is in this time period. We got people who receive Jesus, people who haven't yet. Um, let both grow together until the harvest, which is the kingdom of heaven that we talked about. All right. And at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, which is all right. First, this is what he's going to say at the time of harvest. I need the kingdom of heaven at the time period. First, 
gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. So this will be a time period. This is why you, you want to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior now, because when all those things happen I just talked about, you don't want to be that. You don't want to be those tares. You don't want to be the ones that are going to get tossed into the burn. Okay? But gather and then gather the wheat to my barn. Then, then in verse thirty-one through thirty-five talks about the other two parables that he's uh, talking to him. But then verse thirty-six picks back up. Then Jesus sent the multitude away. Because that, that's what he would say to the multitude. But his disciples, he felt that he could be a little bit more spiritual with them because he thought they were disciples. They were co learners of Christ and they were trying to understand even further. So G then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house. And his disciples came to him saying, Hey, can you explain to us, and they were true, explain to us the parable of the tares of the fields? He said, All right, can you explain that, that tares parable thing again? He said, All right, sure, sure. He answered and said to them, he who sows the good seed is the Son of Man, but Jesus. The field is the world. In this particular case, it's talking about the physical world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, those who truly receive Jesus. But the tares are the sons of the wicked one, when the enemy came and, and sowed bad stuff for people to stay in darkness. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age. When, when you see the end of the age written in the Bible, it's referring to this right now, this is an age. The end of the age is between now, up until the time that Jesus comes back for the second coming. Up, meaning up until the time that Jesus comes back, puts Antichrist, in, um, destroys the Antichrist, puts the devil away, that's going to start a whole new age because that's going to be the kingdom of heaven. So this is the end of the age up until that point in time. All right? The enemy who sowed uh, is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in a fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness and will cast them into the furnace of fire. Guess what, folks? This is after the rapture. Again, remember the chronology we talked about. This is, all of us as believers are already with Jesus. This is, again, this is that great tribulation when Jesus comes back, meaning there are still people after the rapture, after all that great tribulation who still were choosing not to receive Jesus. Jesus said, now I'm going to clear all this up. For this next thousand years, there's going to be peace down here. All right? I will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Some things in the Bible are figurative for a spiritual benefit. This is literal. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Not of us. But for those who, after all that, still chose not to yet receive Jesus' Lord. Then the righteous will shine forth because he's bringing us with him. As the Son, in the kingdom of their Father, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Anytime you see that, you understand that means there are people around experiencing this word, hearing this message, seeing the scriptures, but then there are only going to be some that will choose to apply. So I, he's like, I understand there's 20 people around, but those who have ears to hear that want to receive this, let them receive it. Because he understands there may be people who didn't receive it, who chose not to receive it. Right? Now, let's look at another scripture. Again, so let's talk about the difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. What's our kingdom of heaven go with these? Matthew 13, 47 through 50, New King James Version. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a drag net. You know, the drag net, like a little fishing, a big net, that was cast into the sea and gathered some of every kind of. A male, female, black, white, race, Asian, doesn't matter. Every kind, which was full. They drew to shore, as both believers and, and non-believers, and they sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but threw the bad away. Again, it's all about the kingdom of heaven. All right? So it will be at the end of the age. Okay? So we understand some differences there between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. The angels will come forth, Separate the wicked from among the just. The just is our Christians because we are called the just because it's, we are, it's the justified. 
when we choose to receive Jesus, one of those benefits we talked about means we're just because we're justified, meaning just as if we've never sinned. We is not, not, by, not by our works, it's Jesus' blood. When God sees us, he sees Jesus' blood, so it's just as if we never sinned because his sacrifice and his shedding of blood and his remission of sins. And cast them, so then the angel will come forth, separate the wicked from among the just, and cast them into the burst of fire. Again, they will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Okay? All right. The difference between those two kingdoms. All right? So here's some, some background here. So in Matthew, some Bible, some Bible scholars vary on this. So it, and some Bible scholars um, think that because in Matthew in particular, uh, they say that Matthew used kingdom of heaven instead of kingdom of God, that they were the same um, because the Jewish people were so in awe of God that they wanted not to, they didn't want to say the name of God. So they would use other references of God, so they would say heaven instead of God. The only challenge with that theory is Matthew used God about, when Matthew spoke, he's, his, his primary, when Matthew spoke, his primary audience was the Jewish people. Mark is more about the Gentiles, Luke was about the Gentiles as well. And John was a little slightly different. But those the first three were the synoptic gospel theory. We had things in common. The only challenge with that theory is Matthew used God about 52 times. So that's that's one slight fallacy in some of those scholars' theory that, that he was afraid to use it and only, and only use kingdom of heaven and a little kingdom of God. Um, because, but that wouldn't be consistent because, again, he used the term of God 52 times. He was talking to um, the Jewish people. Also, in the Old Testament writers, when it was definitely all about the children of Israel, they definitely used the term of God, God and they obviously with Hebrew names uh, for the different uh, aspects of God. You know, like shalom and feet. All right? So they definitely use God. So that's a little, you know, a slight challenge for some of the biblical scholars in terms of their theory with that. Okay? Also, Matthew mentions the, both the kingdom of heaven and mentions the kingdom of God. All right? He mentions the kingdom of God roughly about six times, uh, four of which uh, without interchanging it with uh, the kingdom of heaven. So again, this is just clarifying there are some differences between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. There's, there's some background that you may have heard through other Bible scholars and some study on your own as well. Now, <clears throat> so overall, is there a difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven? Again, overall, yes and no. Uh, because the kingdom of heaven, because, again, the kingdom of God is the broad, but because the kingdom of heaven is part of the kingdom of God, meaning when Jesus comes back, what they're doing, they are implementing the kingdom of God. And that time period is called the kingdom of heaven. So because... Um, the kingdom of heaven is part of the kingdom of God. Some things can be said of both of them, um, and yet there are still some distinctions as well. Like in Matthew 18 and 3, you see that they made a distinction and say, look, you got to be converted to get into this kingdom of heaven thing. So he made it clear, like, you have to receive Jesus, your Lord and Savior, to, because you don't want to be part of that tear, you don't want to be burned. So that's a big distinction. All right? So even though the kingdom of God and the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, there are a lot of similarities, and some things can be said of both, there are still some distinctions as well. <clears throat> Let's just look at a few, hopefully, I know the font might be a little small here. But this is a, let's look at a, a few distinctions here. And both are blessings, so that's a good thing. I mean, think about it. This is going to be like heaven now here on earth during Jesus' millennial reign. Nothing bad, literally, nothing bad here on earth. That's a great thing. Praise God. And they're all going to be implementing and doing the kingdom of God stuff. So, kingdom of heaven, again, you reference these as the proof text, again, because it's always. On a hardest ministry that you be like the Marines. Don't just believe it because Pastor Mike said, no, 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 you go back and study the word, make sure what you heard is true. Amen? Yeah. So, kingdom of heaven, some of the intentions. So that's going to happen physically down here on earth. You can reference uh, Revelation 5 and 10, uh, Zechariah 14 and 9. Whereas with the kingdom of God, that's like we said earlier, that's in heaven, in earth, and in us. You can reference 1 Corinthians 15 and 28, Jude 14. Kingdom of heaven, again, begins at Jesus. Now, Technically, the Jewish people had the opportunity when Jesus was here as, from the kingdom, but they just chose not to. But so it begins again when Jesus' second coming, i.e. the millennial reign. You remember 2 Timothy 4 and 1, Zechariah 14. Um, for the kingdom of God, it actually is now. It's now and throughout the future. And so it's, it's now because it's both 
in heaven, in earth, and within us, so it's now, as well as um, in the future, in the ongoing. Another distinction, uh, the kingdom of heaven is outward. People will be able to physically see Jesus and see the saints. They'll be able to see those things, so it's an outward expression. You reference Daniel 7, 13 through 14, and Jude 14. And then also, but the distinction with the kingdom of God, that's without show. Why? Because that's within us. I mean, they're not shown until we physically see Jesus. Now, people can see the manifestation and the fruit that God is doing through you. You can say it from that perspective. But it's not a physical show. Like, oh, like other scriptures say, we're not going to be able to say, oh, see it here or see it there. Okay? You reference Romans 14 and 17, 1 Corinthians 4 and 20. All right? Now, so, are there benefits? Let's get to some, let's get some other pieces now. Really not be more to that. Are there benefits to being a kingdom citizen? Because we're talking about this. We're talking about being a kingdom of God. So is there, are there benefits of being a kingdom citizen? Oh, yeah, yeah, most definitely. Well, hey, in the kingdom of God, you're an heir of God. You're a joint heir of Christ. Praise God. We I mean, stop there. You are an heir of God and joint heir of Christ. Yeah, that should be it. Yeah, you, you know, you can represent eight, Romans 8 and 6. 16 through 17. In the kingdom of God, we are fishers of men. What does that mean? That means out of all, the Bible says, we are a new creation. We hold all things in the past way and we become new. God, with all the things he created, he chose us to be vessels to do the number one thing that he wanted, which was people to glorify him through his son Jesus Christ. It's a huge responsibility, but it's a huge peace. It's an honor that he chose us to be fishers of men. That's the number one reason why we are born is to glorify God. Mm -hmm. That's a huge honor that he chose us. He didn't choose the trees. He didn't choose the dog fight out. Praise God. And, but that's, you know what I mean? That's huge. Guess what? In the kingdom of God, all the promises of God and Jesus are yes. That's a good benefit. What does that mean? Praise. So all those scriptures that are promises in God, both the things that are automatic as well as the things that, that are conditional, and we have a part to play, in Jesus, they're yes. Amen. Yeah. If you wonder why some of it may not have happened, you have to go back to our faith series. It may have been something that you didn't do. Uh -huh. Not on God, it might be on us. Not that we're bad Christians, it might have been something we just didn't know. So go back to the faith series, but yep. All the promises of God doesn't change the fact that all the promises of God still yes. Because you did, uh oh, <laughs> because you didn't receive that thing you wanted, doesn't change the fact that all of God's promises are yes and Jesus saying that. Yeah. So that means we gotta come up. Come on. Second Corinthians one and twenty. In the kingdom of God, you're already blessed with every spiritual blessing. You can reference Ephesians one and three. That's huge. I mean, these are just some of the benefits of being a kingdom citizen. And uh oh, in the kingdom of God, God forgives us. Amen. I'm talking about post, yeah. after Come on. we receive Jesus our Lord and Savior. Thank From the pulpit Jesus. to the back door, Amen. Christians mess up, Christians sin. Mm. The difference, though, is our hearts is that we don't want to do it. Now, we ain't being forced. We ain't, you know, I don't want to get twisted now. We, we, we choose. Right. But our heart is that we don't want to continue in that. Amen. Whatever the that is, you fill in your own blank. And like first John 1 9, when we are sincere and we confess our sins, yes. God is faithful yes. and just to forgive us of our sins yes. and to clean us of all unrighteousness. Yes. That's for the current Christians. Yes. That's not for the unbelievers. Yes. So that being the case, this is a blessing benefit that God forgives us. Amen. Praise God. You reference Psalm 103, 1 through 3. Guess what? In the kingdom of God, you're healed. Yeah. By Jesus. You're healed. That's, that's the Old Testament calling your forth as, as a type is foreshadowing, or the type going forth as a prophecy. And also 1 Peter first solidifies it. By Jesus strikes for healed. Praise God. That's a, another huge benefit. What does that mean? That means by Jesus strikes for healed. That means that blessing both keeps things from us that we don't know, from a sickness, disease, illness perspective, and if any of those things come on us, we have a benefit that it's going to be removed from us. Mm -hmm. Again, doesn't change the fact. Kingdom of God, in the kingdom of God, you live forever. 
Wait, how is that? If you go back to this series we talked about, when we distinguish, like in First Thessalonians 5 and 23, we're a spirit that has a soul that lives in the body. The real us is spirit. The part that connects to God is spirit to spirit. Our soul is our mind, our will, our emotion, our imagination, our intellect. That's the soul part of us. And then there's the body, our five senses. The real part of us, you know, the part that goes to be with Jesus when we're absent from the body, that's the real us. So we already talked about that. So when you go transition, let's, let's follow this up. When you go transition to be with the Lord, your spirit is still alive because he's with Jesus. Your soul is still alive because he or she is with Jesus. Bless you, Jesus. He's with Jesus. And then if you follow that same pattern, we just talked about what the scriptures say. When Jesus comes back for the rapture, your body supernaturally merges. That's why they're often in scriptures, but you'll go check it out for yourself. When Jesus refers to those who they were saying was dead, he said, no, 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 they ain't dead, he's asleep. When you go home and take a nap, you won't get up. That's why Jesus said, they're asleep. He didn't call them dead. He said dead after they didn't get dead. He said, they sleep. No, they sleep. He's like that. He said, all right, fine, they did. Because they didn't get the concept. So you got to understand, even in that instance, that body, my papa, even though that body is in the ground, he ain't dead. He just sleep. Because he's again going to wake up and be supernaturally merged with his spirit and soul. So as Christians, we, when the Bible says we have everlasting life, the Bible means we have everlasting life. We have eternal life. Amen. There's this side of life, and there's the other side of life. Mm -hmm. So as a Christian, as a bit of being a kid of citizen, you literally live forever. So, as kingdom citizens, we need to begin to renew our minds and think from a kingdom perspective and think like God. That sounds like heresy. And the Bible says, the same mind and Jesus in Christ Jesus. Amen. Yes, it is. How is that possible? So that scripture that talks about uh, our thoughts are not his thoughts, his brain not his When you do a search on that, you'll understand they weren't talking to Christians. He was talking about those who weren't like God. So of course their thoughts were not like God. Of course their ways were not like their ways. But when you choose to receive Jesus, your Lord, and Savior, and when you receive the baptism with the Holy Spirit, you have the mind of Christ. We still being sanctified, we still grow, we still mess up, we still growing. Praise God for His grace and love and forgiveness. Amen. But just because you sinned two minutes ago and messed up, and you sincerely ask forgiveness and want to get better, your position is still secure. God never leaves us, people leave God. So we have to begin to think like God. So what does that mean? One of the, as a kingdom citizen, you're an ambassador. A lot of you may know what I mean. You can reference 2 Corinthians 5, back in the 20th. Ephesians 6 and 20. So as an ambassador, a lot of you may notice here in the, in the natural. So let's just, I think I use the term for the U.S. citizenship or whatever. So an ambassador is one who is in a foreign place, but they are charged to operate and act like from where they came from. So let's just use a natural example with, let's say, the Chinese embassy. When they are right here in D.C. or in the United States, within their embassy compounds, they do everything the Chinese do. Mm -hmm. they, they, they operate. They are bringing the Chinese government in that embassy, in that compound, because that's what they do. Mm -hmm. So even though they are on foreign ground, they're on U.S. ground, they're on so-and-so street in D.C., they are operating within that embassy the way the Chinese operate. And they are charged to go forth and, and bring forth and do the things the Chinese people do, even though they're in a physical different place. Well, we have that same charge. When you are a new creation, you are now an ambassador in Christ. So you are on earth like it is in heaven. Right? So we are now charged to now be in this foreign land, operating, doing kingdom of God things in this foreign land, because we are ambassadors representing the king down here on earth, teaching people the way it should be in heaven. Amen. All right, now, another... Renew our minds in a way to think like God. We have to see ourselves as God sees us. 
So no longer say you're depressed. No longer say you're bad and speaking about the problems. I'm not saying deny the challenge, but you've got to be like they say in Joel. Let the weak say I'm strong. Remember that other scripture that says, meditate on your word. Don't let it depart from your mouth. So it's easy. It's the world way to speak the problem. You got to speak what, the, what God says about you. You got to say, I'm royalty. I ain't talking about ego children. I'm not, so don't go there. You know, we talk about just repeat what God says about you. The Bible says, you can describe that scripture. Let the weak say I'm strong. You, that you're royalty. You're a chosen generation. Reference 1 Peter 2 and 9. That's just a few. But again, kingdom mindset is I need to think about myself and think like and see myself as God sees me. You're not worthless. Amen. God wouldn't sacrifice his son for people who wouldn't think that were worthless. Amen. He saw Amen. promise in Amen. you. Amen. He saw the development in you. He put his trust in you that you could do the same thing he wanted to do. Amen. Praise God. Now, in the kingdom of God, we understand it, it's, again, changing our mindset, it's opposite of the world system. We're talking about world, talking about the physical world, but the world system, the way the devil operates in this system to kind of get things off. So, in the kingdom of God, there's tithing. Ain't no tithing in the world. <laughs> <laughs> and it tells you, it such blessings as protection over finances and blessings, but tithing is a kingdom thing. It is not a world thing. They won't understand, even though they kind of implement it like that. You'll see them spend ten million dollars to get a building that's worth eighty million. So they'll they'll try to operate some. It's, it's still a law, but the concept is this kingdom thing. You mean you can operate on at minimum ninety percent, but certainly you get an offering less than that of your income a year. How? How did Jesus give tax money from a fish? That's a kingdom thing. So again, we have to renew our mind. Mm -hmm. Because how does someone get healed from cancer? Mm -hmm. That's a kingdom thing. Mm -hmm. Now I understand there may be other people who, who aren't Christian that may have gotten. I'm not saying that can't ever happen. But I guarantee you the Bible is some Christian prayer. Mm -hmm. Spitting for healing. Come on. <laughs> Come on now. Who does that? Like Jesus spit one time he spit on the ground. The other time he spit in the cat's eyes. Come on now. Look, look. You're not going to see these things in the world. These are kingdom things. Now, let's be clear. When anybody comes back to me, I ain't telling you to go spit in somebody. You've got to be hearing from God on there. But my point is, you can pray. The Bible says prayer of faith heals the sick. So you can pray for someone, whether it's a cold, whether it's cancer, whether it's AIDS. Your prayers are entreating God to be involved in that situation. Don't ever minimize that. It's a kingdom thing. Now, in the world, to be puffed up and be exalted is people got to you know, promote themselves and do all kinds of stuff with, with their ego. Uh, but in the kingdom, guess what? It's the low and the humble. The Bible says the first, meaning the people who try to push themselves up to, to make themselves be all the first shall be last. And the last means those who humble themselves. Oh, that's, in the, that's not just a global. That's in relationships. That's husband and wife. That's kids. That's people in a job. Those who humble themselves will be first. Humble. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Again, the distinction between um, kingdom citizenship, to think like God. Kingdom says, don't return evil for evil, nor insult for insult. If yeah, somebody insults you, your flesh was insulted back. Your mama. Yeah, you know what I mean? Tell my mama, you know what I mean? What's up? Right. Don't return evil for evil, nor insult for insult. But, but what? In the kingdom, to the contrary, bless him. Why they talk about, yeah, you gotta return blessing. That's a kingdom thing. It's better to give than to receive. A heart piece. I mean, so he doesn't want people only focusing on receiving and not wanting to be the other. It's a heart piece. 
So he says, look, from the heart perspective, it's better to give than to receive. Oh, my God. All right. Pray for those who spitefully use you. Again, our mindset is different. You know how you were before Christ? Those who hate one. <laughs> you may, I don't know if you was praying for him back then. But, but we need to pray for him now. Amen. All right. Love covers, again, these are all kingdom, just examples of things that are opposite from the world, and that's having a kingdom mindset. Love, I would love covers a multitude of sin. What does that mean? Both in relationships as well as the people at the royal farm. When people mess up, love covers. That's what God just did for you an hour ago. Hey, uh oh, coming down your street. That's spouses as well. First Corinthians 13 makes it clear. We're not called. Paul says, don't keep a record of wrongs. That's a co worker. That's your spouse. Why? Because love covers that. So if God won't remember the sin you just did because you were sincere to ask for forgiveness, how, who will we to hold that to our spouse, to, to our kids, to, to our neighbor? It's a different mindset. That's exactly right. So you see these crowns? That's you, beloved. So we have to think and act like you represent the king and his kingdom. It's a mindset. And always remember, you are the king's heirs. Amen. Give God serve. Glory to God, glory to God. So praise God for his message. This is all his remember this is that time period. You say, alright, cool. I'm gonna highlight to some notes. I did some underlining. I'm gonna make sure I'm in I wanna be I wanna be that doer of the words. I want this to sit and sit on a shelf somewhere or, or sit. We wanna take it out and apply it, amen. And then we got to do the next thing, which is also share with other people. So it's great that we get it, but we got to share it with other people. It may not be if you share it in time, but whatever God says, you may have nothing to do. Whatever God puts in your heart to share, send them some clips of your notes or whatever it is. But it's not just that we get it, but that we share it with other people. Why? Because we're trying to advance this kingdom. We're trying to advance the way God's system, method, and way are doing things down here on earth. Amen? Amen. Why? Because we, we want to we wanna be like this other person, right? All right, James 1, 20 through 25, but be doers of the word, and not hearers only, sure. see it for yourself. For if anyone is a hearer of the word, and you know, to hear it, and not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in the mirror. Maybe Cain is served, and didn't want to do anything with it, but he observes himself, goes away, leaves service, and maybe forgets what kind of man he was. But he, this is all of us here, you two today, amen? Yeah. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty, and continues in it, and is not forgetful here, but a doer of the word, this one will be blessed when we die. Amen. Yes, Give God the word. Amen. Amen.